exactly what shit did you have in your throat right before we started recording? That sounded terrible. <laughs> well, you know, the more I talk, the hoarser I get <clears throat> just throughout the day. And my wife is always on my butt about, go get something to drink. And as I was coming in here to turn this on, she's like, get you something to drink. So I got me a bottle of Gatorade here. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah, Gator, Gator Aid uh, down there in Florida. If you haven't fun. figured it out now, we kind of skipped part of the introduction. Hey, guys, welcome to bit. Game of Crimes, the penultimate true crime podcast on the internet. By the way, it's the only one where we actually talk to the real people involved in the real stories, and it's done by real cops. Well, one real cop in a sort of wannabe used to be a cop, but then, you know, kind of became a fed. <laughs> and one guy that would go get you gas and change your tires. I mean, he's a trooper. <laughs> Fucking A. DEA won't do that for you, pal. It's that's service right. courtesy and protection. <laughs> we call <a> trooper. <laughs> <laughs> you call troopers. That's right. Hey, guys. So welcome back. This is episode 89, Game of Crimes. Uh, I am here. You know, obviously, it's me and Murph. You kind of figured that out by now. Um, but uh, this is going to be a good one. We'll get into that in just a second. Just a little bit of housekeeping here. Head on over to Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars. It really helps us out. It really, really does. We It's helped us bring on some new advertisers. Uh, we're, we're trying to take this show to another level. So all of your help really helps us. So we appreciate it. Head on over to Apple, Spotify. Hit those five stars. Our advertisers do take a look at that. They see what kind of ratings we have. Mm -hmm. And you guys have definitely helped us out a lot. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. We will have the book from our next guest coming up. Uh, and I'm telling you, you you're, you're going to want to get it. You're going to want to read it because once you hear the story, it's like you're going to want more detail. So head on over there. That's where we put everything. Also, follow us on that internet sensation called social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But I'm telling you, Murph, I know where you have to be. And it's at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes because that's where you and I get to see, guess what? Or we get to see, we get to hear stuff that we recorded. I mean, we know because we're right there. We record the stuff. It's like nine one one. What's your emergency? You can't make this. Shit. Yeah, one nine nine. You have to don't be don't be saying nine one one. Kids, do not try this at home. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we've got our Q and A. Uh, it'll uh, just have uh, come out by the time we do this. So we've always got people sending us. We answer all questions. Uh, I think we're going to have a discussion too about the Alex Murdoch case. And uh, mm -hmm. as new evidence came out breaking down some of the statements, which goes back into his 911 call that we did and taking a look at some of the language around that. So that's something we're, we're going to take a look at. But guys, we've got a ton of content on Patreon. Uh, we dig into more details on stuff and you're going to hear stuff there. You don't hear here. See, there's two here's different, spe different here. spellings here here. here, here. All right. So that's where you need to be. Patreon.com slash game of crimes. Now, Murph, I got to warn you, you may have forgotten. This is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but what? As you know, we don't take ourselves serious. And and I mean, you you probably heard us being a little silly when you came on today. It's because we're so excited. We we just lined up a new guest to be on the show that I'm not even going to tell you who he is. But I, I told him I said when we do your interview, don't don't be surprised if I tear up during the interview because this this guy went through the shit and survived. I can't wait to get him on here. Yep. Yeah. And we're going to do that. We may be recording that this week. Yep. So, hey, but before we get into all the fun stuff, hey, just a couple quick things. Uh, head on over to Game of Crimes fans. Our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato, will determine if you're worthy of entrance into the inner sanctum where we discuss and share things. Not normally you won't see it on our uh, our group page or our, our fan page. So this is the group page, Game of Crimes fans. Just look for that uh, and just see all the fun that's going on. I'm telling you, there's, there's stories posted, a lot of personal stuff, and people will give personal stories about some of the episodes we release. So it's good stuff. Oh, and you know, some, I mean, some of the people really, you know, I mean, they, they just opened their hearts with some of the things going on in their lives. And that's the cool, th the cool thing about Game of Crimes fan page is everybody looks out for everybody. It's, it's mostly a lot of fun. Uh, when people go through serious things in their lives, I, you know, I just went through knee replacement surgery about four weeks ago and I can't tell you how many comments I got back from everybody and Everybody, I love you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And let me tell you, if you had seen his knee like I did up close and personal, oh, God. <laughs> it's looking good, man. I went to PT today. The guy, he brought a tear to my eye today. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but he got me. I, I'm at 123 degrees bend on the knee right now. So that's, I was at 110. He's already got me up to 123. Oh, and that's, the pain is in those last few degrees, pal. <laughs> but I can, I can take it. I can take it. Hey, but Murph, 
Yes. But before we get into the rest of the podcast, the rest of the episode, I have to ask you, and I know it's Florida, and it's kind of, we're recording this in the afternoon, so you may fall asleep, but it's not the blue plate special time. Guess what time it is? It's time for... Small Town Police Blotter. Hey, look, I've got a couple stories, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to take one for the team. I'm going to make fun of Kansas, some of their Kansas laws. Okay. Don't worry, West Virginia and Florida are in the hopper, but I thought I would (laughs) spread it around. Now, we have a couple stories that come to us from different areas. I thought they were funny, but Steve, Mm -hmm. back in March, this is actually 2016. The Granite Shoals Police Department in Texas, population 5,289, salute, Uh, issued a very special warning on its Facebook page that declared, if you have recently purchased meth or heroin in Central Texas, please do not pass go, do not collect $200, take it to the local police or sheriff department so that it can be screened with a special device. Do not use it until it has been properly checked for Ebola (laughs) contamination. (laughs) Now... (laughs) If you fall for that, you need to be charged with being felony uh, stupid. Uh, if they fall for that, I got some swampland here in Florida for them. Well, Chastity Hobson won't be taking you up on it because she brought in a sample of her illegal substance to be examined, was promptly arrested and held on $5,000 bond. Oh, my God. You're not kidding. That's felony stupid. <laughs> this this one may get close, too, Steve. A, uh, this comes to us from Stewart, Florida, population 17,425. Salute. Salute, Florida. Investigators down there searched, again, another story from 2016. Stupidity knows no boundaries. There <laughs> is no time limit on stupidity. For a guy named Mac Yearwood in connection to an open battery case, not a crime of the century, but, you know, battery, they got a warrant for him, right? Mm-hmm. So he assisted them by using his mugshot from a previous incident as his Facebook profile photo. <laughs> He couldn't get his own photo, so he used that. Taken directly from the Stewart Police Department's <laughs> Wanted of the Week poster. Well, when you do that, guess what? Uh-huh. You leave a digital trail. <laughs> and then they tracked him back to his brother's house and picked him up on two warrants. Uh, afterwards, Stewart Police Department Corporal Brian Bossio wrote online, Facebook is a great way to communicate and connect with old friends and family. If you are wanted by the police, it's probably not a good idea to use the Wanted of the Week poster of yourself as your profile pic. <laughs> I wonder how long it talk, took them to scrape that capital I off his forehead for idiot. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Man. Uh, you know, again, you know, and that's what you hear on Patreon. You can't make this shit up. You can't make this stuff up. Okay, Steve, real quick. We'll fun- close this out. I picked out, there were a bunch of them, I picked out five laws, five dumb laws. I think some of these are dumb. Topeka is the state capital. In Topeka, it is against the law to scream in a haunted house. That's what everybody does in a haunted house. How do you have a haunted house and not expect people to scream? <laughs> Come on, Kansas, you're better than this. I guess that's how Topeka makes uh, makes their revenue, huh? Well, guess what? There is no singing in the rain in Topeka either. If you sing in the streets at night, uh, you can be arrested for causing a disturbance. But does it have to rain? You can sing it. You can sing anytime. I'm just saying, you know, that was a Fred, you know, Fred Astaire thing. I'm singing yeah. in the rain. Yeah. All right. Jeez. Steve, you may be pissed off, especially a uh, little town of Derby, though. It's a, kind of a little town. 25,625. Salute. Salute. <laughs> it is illegal to hit a vending machine that stole your money. Oh, man, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> it's understandable, but folks, you don't want to go to jail for that. Now, in the home of Bob Dole, Russell, Kansas, 4,401. Salute. Salute. Guess what? Musical car horns are not allowed. Oh, you can't play Dixie or anything? Come on, man. da 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 No, no, Dixie, you know, none of that. And finally, uh-huh. one of the smallest towns we've had on here, Natoma, Kansas, population 302. Salute. <laughs> the practice of throwing knives at men in striped suits is prohibited. Do you want to take a striped suit off? I'll tune you up there, big boy. I'll tune you up, you <laughs> some bitch. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. It, and you know, somebody had to do things to result in these laws. <laughs> why just striped suits? Why, why, why not? There had to be something about striped suits back then. I don't know what it is. I am going to get to the bottom of this. I swear to God, when I go back to Kansas, I'm making a trip to Natoma.
and you find out the real story. What the hell is going on here, people? All right. We will bring you the rest of the story. As Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. Well, th- this is the rest of the story because um, we get into a lot of it here, but if you ever wanted to know what heroism was like, if you wanted to know what it literally means to be the last man standing, mm-hmm. um, and you want to know somebody who, uh, tell you what, when you hear the story, how this guy, A, survived, B, had the will to survive, mm-hmm. and C, had the will to win, and he did win mm-hmm. in spite of everything else. If Again, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't give you goosebumps and make the hairs on the back of your neck raise up, folks, you need to seek medical attention right away. I tell you what, <clears throat> we're talking about Eddie Morales. You may have heard back in the was it? I think it was the early eighteen eighty six. They uh, there was a bank robbery crew down in Miami and South Miami, where eventually two FBI agents were killed. I think five agents wounded and two bad guys killed. Yep. Eddie Morales was the hero of this thing. Everybody's a hero for staying in there and doing their job. The two agents that gave their life. One of them was a graduate of West Virginia University Law School. So that's if you do that, and I don't mean this. In a funny way, <laughs> we're kind of related, you know, because you took the time to come to West Virginia. Um, but even at the end of the story, we thanked Eddie for going through this again. It happened all those years ago, and it's, he still gets emotional about it. And and I, you know, I'll be the first to tell you when when they get emotional, I mute my mic because <laughs> you might hear some sniffing going on over here. Heroes to the nth degree mm-hmm. faced death, standing up, walking towards them. It's just miraculous what he did. So uh, let's get on with this story so that people can hear just about this these these moments of bravery that, God bless, I hope no, no other police officer has to go through. Well, there's only one way we're going to hear these stories. And I tell you, this is, when we say uh, these are stories of the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, folks, this was it. So Murph, are you ready to hear the, uh, and you know, I got to ask you one question. Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the Game of Crimes. I tell you what, I'm sitting here with goosebumps already, and I've heard the story because we did the interview, but everybody get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. And I mean, seriously, hold on to this one. It's a good one. Bring on Special Agent, FBI Special Agent Eddie Morales. Guys, this is going to be a special episode. Not only do we have yet another FBI agent on, and by the way, we have suspended our normal rule of making fun of the FBI because this one, this 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 dude's a badass. Uh, hey, we, Murph, we got a we got a hero on here today. We absolutely do, and we're going to start off, Murph. I know you wanted to make let's let's make our dedication before we get started. Absolutely. So, uh, all our listeners, uh, our guest today is Eddie Morales, retired FBI agent. And if you're familiar, back in 1986, there was a a shootout, a bank robbery shootout in which a couple of agents were killed. And Eddie's going to tell a story. I'm not going to go any further than that. But there, unfortunately, two FBI agents died that day in the gun battle. So we're dedicating today's uh, entire episode to the FBI special agents Jerry Dove and Ben Grogan. Um, and if their families are listening here, God bless you. Your your loved ones were true American heroes. Uh, into watch April eleventh, nineteen eighty six. So we're going to talk about that. So we start off by saying that. So you know, Ed, uh, I know these were all friends of yours and stuff, but we want to say thank you and welcome to the podcast. And uh, let's just get started, man. You know, think of ours, Cosa Nostra. And I'll think of ours. How did you get? How did you get started in this business? Uh, what were you drinking one night uh, in your underwear? Got thrown in front of a police department? Decided to sign up? How did this thing happen for you? <laughs> that, that's a better story than the real one, you know. Really. <laughs> no, but first of all, let, let me thank you guys. I really appreciate the invite. You know, I always, uh, I always make a special effort to try to, to hook up with uh, prior law enforcement guys, um, you know, agents, uh, you know, sheriffs, deputies. Does that include uh, DEA? Well, DEA, uh, does that qualify as law enforcement? Or I've been asking that this whole time. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, DEA don't expect anything, so that explains it right there, right? <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, all kidding aside, I really appreciate the invite, guys. And uh, as far as how I got started, you know, it, you know, I'm a product of the 50s and 60s. You know, back then, I grew up in South Texas. I was a poor little brown kid, you know, in South Texas. Um, except that, you know, in South Texas. 
uh, Alice, Texas. Uh, that's uh, about 50 miles inland from Corpus Christi on the coast. Was that the famous song that was made, You Can Get Anything You Want at Alice's Restaurant? Was that about that down there? Uh, you know what? I don't think you could get – I don't think there were any restaurants in Alice at the okay. time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's how, how small, small it was. You know? yeah. but, uh, but you know what, though? You know what was cool about it? When I think back, you know, everybody was poor. And nobody had air conditioning. And life was great. I mean, I, you know, I, I, my family had a, I had a long, you know, extended family. I had my grandparents uh, living in, in the same block where we lived, you know, so there was constant supervision, you know, on my young butt, you know, so, um, but it, life was great, you know, and uh, th- as I got older, you know, my dad got a new job and he moved away. He moved uh, about 50 miles out uh, to Beeville, you know, so I grew up there, you know, again, uh, Lower middle class, you know, not middle class per se, but just poor. Um, and went through school, you know, had the uh, strong family, uh, you know, church, you know, had a, you know, had a bunch of uh, cousins and uncles that were, uh, had served in the military during the Vietnam War, which was ongoing at the time, you know. So I had a pretty strong, um, you know, strong family background, you know, patriotic and so on and so forth, you know. And as I was pondering my life, you know, closer towards uh, high school graduation, I'm thinking, well, what the heck am I going to do? Wait, wait a minute. A teenager pondering life? I mean, look, I grew up in a small <laughs> town, too. There wasn't much to do, right, but ponder life and drive to the next party. Exactly, exactly. And so I was thinking, you know, well, I mean, what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to be a, a, a farmhand, you know, for the rest of my life or – uh, you know, I, I just had no idea because I, I had no funds for college. I mean, zero. I mean, zero, zero, zero <laughs> funds, you know. So, and then, of course, you know, uh, Vietnam was going on, you know, and, and the draft was still going when, when I was uh, 18. You know, I, I actually got a draft notice. And uh, I'm thinking, ah, crap, you know, that solves my immediate future, <laughs> at least for two years, you know. So I said, you know, um, my uh, cousins and uncles had joined the Marine Corps. So I said, eh, what the hell, you know. I, uh, instead of Instead of getting drafted, I went down to the recruiting office and uh, uh, joined joined for the joined the uh, the Marine Corps. You know, uh, enlisted for four years, and next thing I know, I'm in San Diego. You know, it's the first time I'd ever been. Uh, you know, but no, that's not true. Uh, first time I've been on the West Coast, and San Diego was like, wow. I mean, way different than Texas. You know, so oh yeah, went uh, went through boot, went through advanced infantry training at, in Camp Pendleton, went to my MOS uh, training. And what was your MOS? Uh, my MOS was a forward observer for naval gunfire, you know, a 0849 in the old Marine Corps uh, uh, class classification system. Wait a minute. I thought, the, I thought the Navy was just a taxi cab. I didn't know they actually had guns. <laughs> well, well, Hold on to the guns from the Marines because we don't trust Marines with guns all by themselves. <laughs> no kidding. No, but I tell you what, though, the, Navy, Navy, the Navy's got the big guns, man. I mean, yeah, they, you know, five inch, eight inch, and 16 inch, uh, you know, guns and stuff. They'll run your cool, day. Cool. Mater, was that your pickup line when you were dating? Hey, you want to see a 16 inch gun? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're, going down, we're going downhill quick today. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> That's too funny. No, but I, actually, we, one uh, one month uh, we were we were actually uh, moving gear towards uh, the uh, the port in San Diego. We were being deployed to Vietnam. That was about seventy two, the beginning of seventy two, and then we were in the process of loading, and then we got a, we got word from the sergeant saying, "Hey." Stop! Take everything off. We're going back to the base. I'm thinking, what the heck are you guys talking about? And I asked him. I said, "What's going on?" He said, "Well, apparently, uh, President Nixon uh, and Henry Kissinger at the Paris peace talks had come to an agreement, so they ended the war. You know, so they said, hey, 'Hey, we're not going. So we, we're not deploying.' So they, they we took everything off. Took about a, you know three or four days to get everything off, and then we went to Camp Pendleton. So then I had like three and a half years of duty on my enlistment. I'm thinking, well, not not quite, almost three years of duty on my enlistment. So I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do? You know, so, what did I get so, myself uh, into? You know, so I, uh, something came up. You know, I was in formation one day, and um, the uh, CO comes out and, you know, does this thing, you know, uh, all present then accounted for, that type of stuff, you know. So he made an announcement. He said, hey, uh, the Marine Security Guard Battalion is looking for volunteers to um, for his program. And uh, he said, looking at the records and looking at the requirements, there are only two individuals in, in the company that qualify 
and everybody's looking at him. He said, the qualifications are you got to have three years or more of, uh, of time left on your enlistment. And the, the second criteria is you can't have an arrest record. And that cracked everybody up, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, Wait a minute, only, by that time, most Lance Corporals have been busted back. Most PFCs have been busted <laughs> back, right? At least one Article 15. <laughs> At least, yeah. Well, I wasn't even a Lance, you know, I was a, a PFC, you know. So he said, come see me after formation. So I went in there. The, the, uh, there was, the other guy was a corporal, and he walked in. He said, sir, I'm not interested. Goodbye. Thank you. So uh, he walked out pretty fast. So I went in and said, hey, what, sir, can you help me out, sir? What, what is this? He goes, well, he said, it's a pretty good program. He said, yeah, it's your, your, your uh, security guard at the embassies around the world. And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, so, so, he, I, so I asked him point blank. I said, sir, what, what, would you, what do you think of the program? What would you do? He said, if I were you, I'd, I'd apply. You know, he said, you're young, you're single. I mean, you know, what the hell? I said, okay, sir, put my name in. Next thing I know, like six weeks later, I'm in Washington, D.C., you know, at the training school. And uh, that now, was Wait a minute. I got a question for you. So my, my son was a Marine formerly on active duty. Uh, he never did uh, guard the embassies, but I got to ask you in all your time, did anybody ever steal a gate at an embassy? Steal a gate? Yeah. No, no, you, no. So you, so you're, you're, I mean, you got a, your, your records intact, right? Nobody ever stole a gate while you were on duty. No, 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 no. Never stole a gate. <laughs> that was know? a Marine joke. Sorry. Marine joke. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was uh, very but, lame. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, went to, went to the training, you know, and we're all waiting on pins and needles to see where our assignments were, you know, and it's like, and I was stunned. I mean, they, they, you know, we were getting, we were having guys, you know, sent all over the world, you know, I mean, Canberra. Uh, Australia, you know, Cairo, Egypt, you know, um, the, we even had guys going to, um, God, what was the name of it at the time? China. It wasn't Beijing. It was Peking, I guess, back then. It was still Peking, China, you know, and and Russia. And, and you know, those lucky bastards got to go to, uh, you know, London and, and uh, you know, uh, uh you know, Iceland and Sweden and yeah, I can see this know, thinking, up. where did, where did uh, PFC Eddie Morales get to go? Uh, I ended up going to, so, you know, I was told, Hey, uh, uh, PFC Morales, you're going to Sophia. And I'm going, Hey, that's a, such a romantic sounding name, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know? And I said, Sophia, what's her? <laughs> Sophia, Bulgaria. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking of, <laughs> Did you have to look on a map where Bulgaria I had was? I to look on a map to see where the hell Bulgaria was, you know. Back then, there was no Google, obviously, you know. So I actually had to go to a wall map and find Bulgaria, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, what the... And, uh, you know, it was obviously a communist block, you know, and we, we were given extra training and, and, and uh, you know, uh, warnings and stuff about the communist block. So, but I'll tell you what, though, when I got there, I was, like, stunned. I was, like, shocked, you know. <laughs> I thought it was back in South Texas, with trees, you know. So. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know everything. Every people were poor as poor as dirt, you know. So yeah, I've seen pictures. I've seen pictures of Sophia, and it looked. It actually maybe this modern day, but it looked pretty nice. Uh, I've seen pictures of the, of the modern Sophia, but man, back then, man, you know, the the one word that comes to mind is bleak. I mean, if if you, if you could put a color on bleak, it would be gray, a dirty. That's the a, way most communist country wars or Soviet bloc countries were. It was just like. You know, almost had the bread lines or whatever else. It just seemed like there was a – they shut off the color to the trees or whatever else the minute the, the Soviet Union took over. I don't know what they did, but somebody turned off the color because – you know and you know what it is. You know, you, you, I think back on it. You know, uh, their heating was all coal-powered. And you know how coal, you know, smoke goes out there? It just stains everything. And the buildings were, were covered in coal, you know – you know, soot and stuff. So it, it just looked bleak, you know. <clears throat> and you mentioned uh, bread lines. I mean, that's a for sure thing, okay. There were there were lines, and uh, they only had one supermarket in the capital, okay. And people were always in line waiting. It, they weren't even waiting to buy. They were waiting to see if something was delivered. I mean, that's how bad it was. I mean, you know, people would stand there all day hoping somebody something would be delivered at the market. I'm thinking, wow, what a way to live, man. So... <laughs> After that, uh, you know, that was a real quick down and dirty on Bulgaria. And, you know, there's so much more that, that I could talk about. But, you know, then I got transferred to Madrid, Spain. I mean, that was a, a reward after Bulgaria. You know, wow. so that was super. Hey, that let, was me super ask, great. let me ask you a quick question about some of your training you went to. A friend of mine um, uh, was the chief of counterintelligence for CIA, ended up becoming chief of station at Vienna, which was the Clayton Lone Tree incident, the Marine 
that they ended up arresting because we knew that Marines were being targeted, right, with the, what they called the swallows or being, you know, the the dangles out there. Right. right what right. kind of training did you get back then? Because back then we're talking KGB. I mean, we're talking in the days of the KGB. You, and, and you know what, though? You, you mentioned Longtree. He was in Moscow, not in Vienna. No, no, no. He, uh, he ended up meeting uh, – him in Vienna. He was getting going to get posted there, and he approached him. You're not supposed to know who the chief of station is. Well, the KGB already know who he was because they were looking at changing his post from uh, Moscow to Vienna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know what though? We we uh, it was a very simple rule. You know, do not fraternize. It's simple. No fraternization with the locals. Period. End of story. Okay. And of course, you know, you had, you had all the, the honeypots, you know, the dangles out there, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, of course, you know, I mean, you knew, you knew, it, I mean, you knew it was a setup. I mean, it was so, I mean, they weren't even subtle, you know, they were like, hey, you know, uh, long time, Marine. kind of like, kind of like being on, uh, on some of those, uh, those, uh, river raft tours, you know, where people, guys have signs up, show us your, you yeah. know what, you know, <laughs> it was almost that blatant, you know, like, here's, here's what I got here. No, no, thank you for asking, but that's called direct advertising, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> direct marketing. Well, I mean, it was, it was pointed and to the, to the point, you know, to the point, you know, so <laughs> no, but, uh, I mean, that, that was the rule, no fraternization period, end of story, you know? And and if you followed that rule, I mean, you you couldn't get in trouble. But if you started, you know, trying to, you know, uh, you know, it's Do one a thing to have for somebody or uh, yeah, you know, I help yeah, you yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, 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 it's a it's a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, you just spiral down into a, a, a hole. You know, so um, you know, and I think I think nowadays that, uh, and it might have been back then too during your time that uh, you know to be selected to be a Marine security guard in a foreign in the U.S. Embassy in a foreign country, that was that's somewhat of an honor. Oh, it was a huge honor. I mean, I, I don't know how it is now. I mean, I, I've been out of the Marine Corps. You know, I was doing some math the other day. Man, I was in the Marine Corps uh, 52 years ago. Can you believe that? Uh, you know what? I, I saw your Wait a minute. I didn't believe you there for a second and said, as a Marine, I was doing math. I'm going, oh, no, no, you weren't. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I saw your birthday, and, and you and I are very close in age. Let's don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, really. So, you know, then, uh, then I was rewarded and went to Spain, you know, and that was, that was uh, like night and day, you know. It was like, man, I mean, well, uh, Sophia had maybe like, maybe three quarters of a million people, if that, you know, I get to Madrid, there must have been five million people in Madrid. I mean, it's like, holy moly, you know, talk about fast pace, man. You know, lots of color, you know, people running around, you know, left and right on missions, you know, hey, get, get the, you know, get the job done, you know, got to go to school, got to go to work, you know, got to hit that bar, whatever. Back in the day, did they also, because when I was in like some of the other, Pakistan, Turkey, other places, I was doing State Department stuff, but you'd go in, they did what it was called post one. Did they refer to it as post one back then, or did they have a different phrase for it for that? No, we had, we had post one, post two. Yeah. And in and, and, uh, and Bulgaria, we only had post one. That was because it was so small. <laughs> so small. Yeah. We had, we had five Marines at, at the, in Bulgaria. That was, that was it. You know, that was so. it. Wow. And I think people don't realize this. People think they look at the movies and they go, oh, there's like a company of Marines and a battalion of Marines. It's like, no, nope, nope, there's no. Nope. No, no, we we barely had enough to make a a fire team, you know. <laughs> so, but you know, I got to Bulgaria, you know, and I start, you know, uh, running and gunning with the uh, the young the young crowd there, and that's when I met a gentleman by the name of Jerry Grimaldi. Uh, he, I think he's probably passed on now. I mean, it, it has been, like I said, over fifty years, you know. And he was the uh, I, I was surprised to learn that he was the FBI agent assigned to the embassy. He was what we call the legal attaché. He was a pretty nice guy, you know, very you know, very serious. You know, everybody had great respect for him. And I, I'd never met an FBI agent before in my life, and I was impressed to hell, you know. And uh, got to know him, and you know, back and forth, and he got to know me, um, and. Um, Going back to the uh, in a roundabout way, going back to, to to your original question, what what made me get into law enforcement? Well, as a young kid, you know, I always wanted to be a police officer. And after I got out of the Marine Corps, that was my intention to go back to Texas and be a police officer in, in some department, you know, either uh, city, county, or, or state in some agency, you know. So I hadn't even planned it out that way because by this time I was still I was twenty years old, you know. So so uh, Jerry. Got to know me, and I, I knew him for three years um, in in the uh, in Madrid. And uh, when because I, I, I uh, did I ended my tour in Madrid, I requested to be to be, uh, to be uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, detached or I forget 
when you when you finish your tour uh, released in, in Madrid because I um, me- I met a young lady there and I got married. That was my first marriage, and uh, and I, we were living. She was part of the uh, uh, State Department uh, uh, team there. So um, now, you know, did, did rules of fraternization include other people at the embassy or Americans or just foreign nationals? No, just foreign nationals. Yeah, just foreign nationals. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I met her. We got married, and, and I started going to school there uh, at the University of Maryland at, uh, with the uh, Madrid campus. You know, so started going to school there. And Jerry knew that you know he he'd seen me, and he knew that I was studying. So he, right about uh, in my junior year, he pulls me aside. He said, "Hey, Ed, how, how's how's your um, how's your school going?" I said, oh, "Pretty good, Jerry." I said, "I got uh, about." Uh, half a year, a year left to, uh, to get my degree. He said, "Okay, good." He said, "Have you considered what you're going to do after uh, after you graduate?" I said, "Well, you know, I said not really." I said, um, "I'm kind of looking towards becoming a police officer." And he said, "Oh, that's good." He said, "Have you ever considered being an FBI agent?" And I said, "What?" I, I was shocked. You know, he, he's actually pulling me aside. You know, I said, "Hey," I said, "Wow, Jerry, that's amazing." I said, "But I thought you had to be an attorney or an accountant." You know, again, this this old um, you know, misconception or, or mystique the FBI has, you know, they're either lawyers or accountants, you know, uh, and he says, well, he said, he laughed. He says, well, those are two big programs that the Bureau hires in, but he said, you know, we hire in a, a lot more areas than just, uh, you know, lawyers and accountants. So um, he said, we hire, you know, we hire linguists, we hire uh, scientists, uh, engineers, um, all different kinds of things, you know, but he said, Hey, we also hire former police officers and, and military folks. He said, um, so, um, with you, he said, uh, you, you speak Spanish. Obviously I know you do because you're in Madrid, you know? And he said, you got prior military service. He said, you fill, you, you fill two of the blocks, you check two of the blocks off. And then once you get your degree, he said, I think you'd be a good candidate. He said, "Plus, you've satisfied the work requirement because you were in the Marine Corps for four years, and now you're you're in, you're finishing your your uh, college uh, college studies. You know, so that that counts. You know, so uh, he said, I think you'd be a good candidate. I said, Wow, well, wow, Jerry, if you think that's if you think I you know I'm a, I'd be a good candidate, he said, I know you would be. He said, This is what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to write headquarters and ask them to send me an application." And when I get it, I'm going to give it to you. And this is what I want you to do: make make several copies of the application, uh, and then rough draft your answers to the questions. Okay, because it's not you know some of those questions you know they're they're kind of in depth, and uh, you know you don't want to start on the original and then find out that you screwed it up and then you don't have anything to, to fall back on. He said, "Hey, work with the copy." Get it right. Get you know. Get all the answers square because you you may, you're going to have to write home or or call home to find out what 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 um, what some of the information that's needed. Like it's like you you know all your family members' names, their dates of birth, you know their places of birth, and all this other good stuff. And uh, I, I laugh, you know, because my wife and I, she was also an agent, Liz. You know, uh, we laugh because we said, man, that's that application was so long. It was ten pages. It's like, oh my God, a ten-page application. I, I, I talk to agents nowadays. I think their applications are like 30, 40, 50 pages long. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. You know. So I, I'm thinking t- a ten-page application. All oh, the humanity. You know. <laughs> you know so, and that's one of those things that you want to save throughout your career in case you have to do a re-up. You want to. You know, exactly. it's already done. You don't have to think a whole lot about it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so, you know, it's, it's, this was the way they indoctrinate you into your life. You're going to have a life of paperwork as an FBI oh, agent. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Now, but you know. Jerry was true, true to his word. You know, like a month later, he he uh, finds me, and he said, "Hey, here it is. Here's the application." He said, "Remember, make copies of it. Start working on your answers because you know you're going to have to write home to get some of these answers." You know, I said, "Okay, fine." So uh, I got it all set up. You know, and uh, um, I think I, I hand wrote it. I printed it out because I didn't have. I, I couldn't type at the time. You know, I wasn't you know very good typist. So. Uh, and uh, I was still in Madrid, <clears throat> and I sent it in. <clears throat> I asked Jerry. Um, no, I'm sorry. Jerry sent it in for me. I gave it to Jerry, and he mailed it in. And uh, I, he said, "Hey, I sent it to headquarters. You know, uh, good to go. When you get back to, uh, to to the states, you know, call them up, and and we'll go from there." So Jerry gets transferred out at about the same time that uh, my my first wife's tour and and my uh, my. Uh, 
quote unquote graduation, even though I didn't graduate. I just finished up the, you know, the school. I finished up and then we went back to Washington, D.C., where, uh, where we ended up living. And um, I called FBI headquarters and I said, hey, my name is Ed Morellis. Uh, I sent in an application, you know, for, to, for the agent position. You know, uh, who do I talk to? And they go, well, you know, we have a, an application unit here, uh, a recruiting unit here. But he said, what field office are you in? I said, what do you mean field office? Where are you living? I said, well, I'm living in Arlington, Virginia right now. He said, OK, you have to you have to contact the Alexandria field office, see what they know. I said, so I called them and, and I called Alexandria and they go, who? Who are yeah. you? Well, what do you want? You know? <laughs> yep. And I told, I explained what the problem is, and they said, "Okay, you know, we've got your name, date of birth. You know, said we'll we'll check, you know, headquarters and and Washington field office to see." About a month later, they came back and said, "Dude, we don't have any idea where your application is." You know, so Jeez. I said, "Ah, crap." You know, I said, "Well, I have you a copy." Did of the, a co- that's what I'm about to say. Good thing yeah. you made a copy, right? Yeah, yep. I said, "I have a copy of it. Is is that uh, sufficient? You know, can I send it to you guys?" And they said, "Yeah, copy. We'll we'll, we'll do." You know, I mean, as long as long as it's not marked up. I said, "Yeah." So I hand carried it to the Alexandria office, handed it in. You know, and and they said, "Okay, we'll review it and and it will we'll be in touch." You know, so. Um, Oh, one more thing. Uh, I forgot about Jerry. He said, hey, by the way, Ed, put me down as a reference. You know, so I'm thinking, man, that's great, man. I mean, he got me the application. He recruited me, got me the application, and he said, put me down as a reference. You know, so I'm thinking, wow, that's nice. super. You know, it so. almost sounds like a military recruiter. They're telling me he's exactly, getting them. You know, it's, oh, actually, 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 it almost sounds like a KGB recruiting to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know he was really with the FBI? Yeah. <laughs> really, exactly. You know, so. Ah, comrade. Okay, comrade Morales, continue <laughs> that's, on. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. So anyway, I went through the application process, and um, – in um, Alexandria, you know, and from the time that I sent the original application in until I was recruited and sent to the academy, it was 18 months. But the actual in-country, you know, when I came back to the States, it was nine months. Um, I contacted the um, Alexandria field office in January, and by September, I was in training class, you know, which, you know, I guess is pretty quick, you know, so... But, uh, you know, by the way, Alexandria Field Office is no longer an no office. No longer. In- WFO is actually in Washington, D.C. now, right? Yeah. Yeah. WFO. It, well, WFO always was in Washington, but WFO never had any what we called resident agencies. They never had any satellite offices. Now they have a whole bunch. You know, they've got Tysus Corner. They've got this Alexandria office. They've got Manassas. God knows where else. And only in the FBI with their way, their penchant for acronyms. So a, a buddy of mine uh, actually... He, he was a special agent in charge out of the Detroit field office, then came out here. Well, there are three basically special agents in charge in Washington, but the person that's over the three SACs is called the ADIC, the assistant director in charge. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and, only- and we refer to him just as a dick. A dick. <laughs> 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 that's what I'm saying. It's all about the marketing. You got to be careful what you say. So the, right. you have the ADIC in charge of the SACs, but... Well, see, you know what? Though it, 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 it all varies. It was the same way when I went in. It was it all it all varies with size because when I came in in uh, in seventy nine, uh, Washington Field Office had four hundred agents, which I thought was like massive. Okay, and then I find out that New York New York office has one thousand agents assigned to it. You know, it's like what the heck? You know that, that at the time that was one eighth. One eighth of the uh, FBI agents assigned to the country. You know, at the time we had eight thousand agents across the country. A thousand of them were in New York. <laughs> so, so uh, and you know what? You had the special agent, uh, the SAC, special agent in charge. He he had like multiple assistant special agents, and then they said, "Hey, this is too much." We need to have a special agent for each borough, like uh, for Queens and the Bronx, and I don't even know what what the other areas are, Long Island and, and Manhattan and, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, so they had to have a special agent in charge for each area, and then you had to have the assistant director in charge of them, you know, so. So anyway, I was recruited. They did the background check, and I got my appointment letter, and, you know, I got, read, got, it, got it in the mail. I have a copy of it somewhere you know, in some archive of mine, I got the assignment letter saying, you know, you've been selected for a probationary period uh, uh, to, uh, to the position of special agent of the FBI, you know, yada, yada, yada. Needs of the Bureau, you know, 
satisfactory completion of training and probationary period and so on and so forth. And it says, your starting pay will be $17,000 a year. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm rich. <laughs> I'm freaking rich. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I get $17,000 a year. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I could buy a house. I swear to God, man. And I'm thinking, man, all I got to do is get through training, you know. So, and, you know, sh- sure enough, you know, in, in 1980, when I graduated, you know, I, they, the, I was, re- I was uh, assigned, I was recruited out of Alexandria and assigned to the Washington field office. So I stayed in the area. And who was and, the uh, director of the FBI when you got on? Oh my God! You would ask me a trick question like that. I, I it See, wasn't. That's we're trying uh, to determine if you're a KGB agent or the real thing here now. It, yeah. uh, I think it was Scott. It was the old, uh, the old sh- sheriff. I forgot his name now. Uh, we'll look it up. I just you know I, because I knew J. Edgar Hoover kind of punched out like what in the seventies was it? He, he, he punched out in seventy two. I think. Yeah. It's like William Webster. Does that sound right? No, no, no. It, it was Webster came in right after I, I came in. It was it was the interim guy in between. He was a former police officer or former uh, police. Was that not the police Philadelphia officer. or New York cop or something? Yeah, he was a he was a, a former police chief of some place. I forget where it was from. You know, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Murph will look it up. So and, and then uh, Willie Web Willie Webster came in after that. You know, so uh, <clears throat> but you know, I I, um, I was assigned to field office. You know, and and like I said, in 1980, I bought a house, man, seventeen thousand. Man, it's like man, I'm a homeowner and everything. You know, so <laughs> it was great. What um, year? You know, what, what, what year was it? You came on seventy nine. 79. It, the, it looks like Webster was uh, February 78 to May 87. Before okay. him was uh, James Adams, an acting. Yeah, okay. I, I, I knew it was right there in between, you know, because um, he, he didn't come to our graduation. You know, it was some, some other uh, high-level uh, forgettable. And before him was Clarence Kelly. That's the one. I thought, that's, who, that's who I thought it was, Cl- Kelly, you know, and it wasn't, you know. So... Uh, Anyway, so, you know, anyway, I got assigned at the uh, Washington field office, you know, but that, that's pretty much how I got, you know, I got into the FBI, you know, it, it, uh, you know, if I hadn't been approached by Jerry the in Madrid, I probably would have been ended up in Texas, you know, and, and either in um, my, my county PD or. Uh, what uh, county were you in down there? Uh, it was called B, like the honeybee. Okay. B, B County. You know, Jerry's name sounds awfully familiar, but I don't know. I tried to look him up here, but I don't see anything on him. Yeah. Wh- whose name? Jer- the guy that recruited you, Jerry? Jerry Grimaldi. Yeah, he was from New York. I, mean, I, I don't know. Was he an instructor at Quantico ever? Mm, I don't know, because when I met him, uh, I met he was a pretty senior agent when I met him in Madrid. And when he when he uh, tr- transferred back to uh, to the States in 79, uh, he ended up retiring soon thereafter. So I mean, oh, he, okay. was pretty, yeah, he was pretty right. senior. We didn't overlap then. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, now that now that you're on, you got your first assignment. So, kind of walk us through. You know, what's your first squad that you're on? You get assigned. Uh, what's the fir- what squad do they put you on? Well, see, Washington Field Office is a is kind of a it's a kind of a flaky office um, <laughs> because uh, you know New York is a massive office. Okay, and and L.A. is a huge office, and so uh, at the time San Francisco, and and you know the big the the top five, and then they had the top ten offices, but Washington Field has the misfortune of being like three miles from headquarters. Okay, so you've got headquarters, and you got the Washington Field office, and I showed up as a new agent, you know, and I'm I'm showing up here, you know, and. Uh, I was assigned to the bank robbery squad and I think, Hey, that's pretty cool, man. I'm assigned to the bank robbery squad. You know, that's like telling people, I said, Hey, I went, uh, <laughs> I went to the, uh, to the, you know, uh, Saskatchewan, you know, school of law and small engine repair, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Look at like, me okay. now. <laughs> you know uh, I, we're assigned to the bank robbery squad, but in reality, we, we were the small engine repair guys, you know, <laughs> Because the bank robbery squad handled applicant cases, background investigations. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> you, you, you think some 15-year cigar-smoking veteran is going to be doing background checks? Hell no. Oh, man. You know, so all the new guys handled all the background investigations, you know. 
Yeah, you know, the bank robbery squad, you know, was uh, half bank robbery and half background investigations. And, and like I was saying, you know, uh, you're not going to have a you're not going to have a 15 year veteran doing background checks, you know. So they worked the bank robberies and the young guys worked all the background investigations, you know. And we did backgrounds for, you know, uh, new applications, judges, U.S. attorneys and other uh, government hires, you know. So, uh, I mean, it was it was a full time job, you know, so. Yeah, but. It seems though, I mean, but so yeah, you're a new agent and stuff, still on probation, but you're not really learning anything. But I mean, even then, you're going to interview for some very sensitive positions. Did they at least give you some training? On oh no, what no, you're they, supposed to they, do? yeah, they, they gave us the training, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't the you know the uh, the glamorous work that we were all looking for, you know. You know, you're you're doing background checks, you know. It's like saying, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm the I'm you you knock on somebody's door, hey, I'm the meter man, and we need to check your meter, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're here it's to talk like, to you about your neighbor. He's applied for a position. Does he do anything like really weird? You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we 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 wanted to run and gun with the real bank robbery agents. You know, so. yeah. But before you run and gun, tell us about the weirdest story or the weirdest thing you found out. You don't need to say who, unless it's really like cool. But uh, what was one of the weirdest things you found out? during a background investigation. Oh God, there's two that remind me that really ticked me off to no end. Uh-oh. One of them was uh, this, this uh, lawyer. Uh, he was an attorney working in Washington, DC. And usually it's the other way around. Usually you have assistant, uh, uh, AUSAs, assistant United States attorneys that, uh, that, go, that leave the, the, uh, the federal prosecutor's office to go work for a, uh, a private law firm. Okay. This guy was, I don't know why at the time it, I, I didn't really know it. You know, at the time, uh, this guy was going from a law firm. He was applying for a, a, a U assistant U S attorney's position in Washington. So I was, I was tasked with, um, with doing some part of his background, you know, I, I did the local Washington background, and if he's from Kansas, somebody in Kansas does the Kansas part, you know, and so on. If he went to school in Berkeley, somebody in Berkeley does does that part, you know. So, but what what really ticked me off about this guy? He is a freaking attorney in Washington D.C. Okay, he was making more than seventeen thousand dollars a year, and this sob had gone to school. I'm not sure whether it was. You know, his, you know, entry level school or masters or, or his law school, but he went to school on a government grant on a government loan, and he had been working as an attorney, and he had not paid back his loan. He had not made payments on his loan, and I'm thinking, what a dirty, rotten bastard, man! And it came up in investigation, and, and I, I did some records checks on that, you know. And I, I turned, I you know, collected the information, collected the made the report, and I turned it into the uh, headquarters. And I figured, well, this guy's toast, you know. This guy, does, you know, hasn't paid his loans. He's a, he's a deadbeat, you know. He probably makes, you know, several hundred thousand dollars a year, and he has chosen not to pay back a loan. And then come to find out, you know, that the guy got hired. In spite of being a deadbeat, you know, instead, of, instead of you know, in spite of being you know not paying back his loan, so I found out later that he had uh, he turned around and he paid the loan off completely. He just went back, wrote a check, and paid off the whole freaking loan. And I'm thinking, dude, if you had that kind of money before, why didn't you pay back your freaking loan, dude? Come on, give me a break. You know that that's the case that I've I've never forgotten, and it's always ticked me off. You know, he's a deadbeat, like you said. But, you know, I, I figured, well, maybe attorneys take care of themselves. I don't know why. You know, that, that's why. Of course they do. <laughs> you know, the other one, which is funny, <laughs> and I, don't, I really don't remember the names, but I was doing a background check. I think it was another attorney, uh, another uh, applicant for a U, assistant U.S. Uh, attorney's position. And I, I did a background check <laughs> on, on, uh, on his residence. And I went there and I'm knocking on doors, you know, I say, hey, you know, I'm Agent Morellis, you know, doing a background check on on Bill Smith, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I got this story <laughs> that this guy was uh, this guy was quite the uh, the Casanova. OK, a ladies, man. <laughs> yeah, at least at least it was ladies and not not guys. I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't say that, you know, but yeah, but but back in that day, that would have been I mean, let's just be honest. Back in that day, that would have been a serious issue because it would have been used by compromise by the KGB exactly. or that, counterintelligence that, that, agents. That, 
that right. probably would have kept them out, you know. So, but anyway, so I'm doing the background check, you know, and and this neighbor gives me an earful, you know. She goes, "Oh yeah," she said, "Man, there was this one time, you know, he he had a girlfriend, a fiance or something." And I said, "Yeah," and it says, "And th- they they were living together in his apartment." I said, "Okay, well, apparently, <laughs> this young this young man." met some girl at work or somewhere and he brought her back home at lunchtime to his apartment and he was in in his apartment with the the other young lady when his fiance returned to the apartment all right to do something or forgot something so she walks into their apartment and finds her her, her boyfriend her fiance in bed with another woman, and he, that neighbor said, "Man, oh man!" He said, "You should have seen the fireworks, you know." So, I, so dang. I, I took copious notes. You know, so, so I took I, copious notes on the copulation. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, so I wrote it up, you know, and, and then I turned it in, and I, I get a request from from headquarters saying, go back and get more details about this incident. <laughs> what, is somebody writing a novel or what? <laughs> That's what I thought. I said, dude, how much more details do you want? The guy had a fiance. He brought a, a third woman back to his apartment. He got caught. There was a big row, a knockdown, drag out, out a fight. Cops had to be called. It's like, you know. And the story, you know, so, and I don't know what happened to that guy. I, I'm sure he got I hired, do. too. He ended up in episode five, the Kevin Stevens episode. Mur- <laughs> Mur- Murph's, partner, it, Murph's partner was wounded in a shootout down at Hialeah. Uh, you know, an informant was killed. But when Kevin was in the hospital, he was talking about he had an armed guard. I said, why was there still a threat? He said, no, I had two girlfriends, and they weren't supposed to meet each other. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. That no, absolutely no, no, no. I mean, that's, uh, that. I mean, that's, uh, it happens, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, life is life, you know, but no, but th- those are, those are two cases that I remember, you know, really, but see, here's the kicker when I say, uh, Washington field was kind of a, a twilight zone, uh, field office. And, and I was a new agent. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, I wanted to work bank robberies, but here I was, you know, trekking down, you know, uh, in, in, infide- <laughs> infidelity cases, you know, and so on, and bad credit risk and stuff like that, you know, for, for government employees, you know. So you we all we all pretty much know the chain of command. You know, I, I have a supervisor, he has a supervisor, and, and then there's a special agent in charge or, or a chief or whatever you want to call it. And that's the chain of command. But in Washington field office, we're three miles from headquarters. So I would be uh, – <clears throat> I would be uh, sitting in my office and at my desk and I'd get a phone call at my desk and I'd answer it. I said, hello, this is Agent Morales, you know, and it goes, hey, this is, um, this is Bill Smith from headquarters. I said, hey, I need you to go do A, B, C, and D. And I'm thinking, okay, hold on, let me, let me make notes. And I would, you know, go out and do A, B, C, and D. Come to find out later that uh, headquarters supervisors should not have been calling me directly. Okay, and it, it was it got to be so routine. It was easier for for the supervisors at headquarters to call the agent involved instead of writing paper, because you know if you needed something done, you, you know how it is. You have to send out a lead. Okay, you have to do paper. You got to get the paper approved. You got the paper's got to go through the system, and depending on whether it's a letter or a teletype, it still has to go through this. It would take like two days if it was a teletype. It would take two days to get to me. If it was a letter, it would take a week. So, you know, the guys at headquarters, I, I could understand what they wanted. You know, hey, pick up the phone. Hey, Ed, I need you to do A, B, C, and D. And I say, okay, fine. You know, and then and then I would do it, and then I would turn it in. And the, my supervisor would say, hey, what the hell is this A, B, C, and D? I said, well, yeah, you know, Bill from headquarters. God damn it. Don't don't answer their messages. You know, they're supposed to go through me. They, I'm your supervisor. They're not your supervisor. You know, so it went just by, you know, I'm being a new agent. I had no idea. You know, well, so. I got to tell you, when I was a detective, our, uh, we had a two man RA down to a one man RA in the town I was at, but the guy was a Riley County, Kansas police officer originally, then went to the FBI actually was on the evidence response team for the, uh, Unabomber, uh, and stuff like that. But he would come to me. We had this arrangement worked out. He would come to me because for him to run guys in this inside baseball, but a triple I inquire interstate identification index. Hey, I need a criminal history. I need stuff checked. If he ran it up his chain through the Kansas city field office, it might take two to three days to get back to him. So he would just come down there and say, do you happen to be investigating somebody by the name of this and a date of birth and stuff? And I would look at it and go, 
by gosh, I think we are, you know, <laughs> what can you tell me about him? And so we would figure out ways to, uh, to, uh, bypass the, uh, the, you know, you know what you just described, do you know what you just described? The beginnings of a task force. That's why we have task forces. You know, it's like, Hey, if, uh, agency so-and-so can, can get, can get certain records faster than it would take me two weeks to get something, you know, and you could do it in two hours and then somebody else, another agency can get, you know, different records, you know, and, and, and from a different area, you know, that, that's why task forces are so great. I know another reason why you have a task force, because um, we've talked about this with Murph, it's easier to get a title three through a state than it is the federal government. Damn. That's right. true. That's very true. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, so let's, let's talk about now about um, your progression, because what we want to do is start setting the stage here very quickly for um, the shootout, April 11th, 1986. But to get down there, you've got to move offices, obviously, because this happens down in Florida, down in Miami. So right, correct, yeah. So how do you get from Washington, yeah, down there? Yeah, I, I was, I, you know, I, I did three years in Washington. You know, I, I went from the uh, bank robbery squad uh, to the terrorism squad. Hey, did you ever get the chance to actually investigate bank robberies? <laughs> no, but you know what? Though, as as time went on, you know, I actually got to respond to bank robberies. You know, I actually did some interviews, you know, I, I, you know, I interviewed some tellers and some witnesses, you know, so, you know, as, as things, you know, you learn, you know, you, you establish a system. Establish sorry, a all rhythm. I can see is you guys going out for a beer and somebody's, what would you do today? Well, we caught two guys robbing a, what'd you do? I got a terrorist. What'd you do? I had a nooner. <laughs> yeah, I had a nooner. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, you know what? I, how do you mean that I had a nooner? You, know, yeah. you investigated a nooner. You oh, got okay. a nooner. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch him, Eddie. I'm telling you, you got, man. <laughs> I was just saying, if you might admit to something, no, you got a guy who was having a nooner that ended up having his fiance come home. <laughs> yeah, semantics. You got you got to get the details right. <laughs> right. You know, so. That's right. Words mean things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but anyway, you know, I I, I did that for for a while. And then I got transferred to a terrorism squad, and then I took an undercover. Uh, I took a year and a half undercover operation in Miami, which is my first time in Miami. And then I was transferred back. And then uh, I uh, got married. I, 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 in the interim, I got divorced uh, from my first wife, and uh, which probably was a very good thing in my <laughs> in my life because things had deteriorated so so much that it was it was a good thing. But anyway, I, I met this other young lady, uh, and she was from Miami, and she was an FBI agent. So. Um, we got married and then that's how I got transferred to my, to Miami from Washington field office. You know, I, I'd married, uh, the, the FBI had a choice. You transfer her to Washington or transfer me to Miami. And it worked out great, man. Cause I'd, I'd rather be in, in Miami than Washington any day, you know? So yeah. Did you ever work with Jack Garcia? I worked with Jack Garcia towards the end of my, uh, towards the end of my career, uh, my career. I worked with him in 2000 and one or 2002. Yeah. We had Jack on our, uh, one of our podcast episodes and it was funny, Murph. I was got, going back, looking at all our FBI guests mm -hmm. until we got Ed here. You know, all of our FBI guests, their first name started with the letter J oh, every no single one of them. <laughs> wow. You're Jerry Clark. Up, yeah. That's right. Hey, you know, it. here I, I've got a, I've got a, uh, I'm not sure what kind of a, a fact about Jack, kind of like the rest of the story. Oh, yeah. We want to hear that. Okay. My wife was in uh, the FBI training, uh, the, in her training class at the FBI Academy. Her classmate was Jack Garcia. Oh, cool. <laughs> He's, so he, my he's the wife, one that dimed you out to us. <laughs> my, my wife knows Jack very well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so. Jack was a hoot, man. The first Cuban, yeah, I mean, he, born in Cuba, first Cuban-American agent, you know, that was hired. And he even, we, I found out he did something pretty cool, but I, I saw why he did it. He, he filed a Freedom of Information Act on his own background to find out what the FBI had found out about him during his own background. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of, a lot of agents do that, you know, but it's like, eh, I mean, I, I've never done it. You know, it's like, I, I I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, you know, oh, they never should have hired me. Look at this. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I got hired on through the Charleston, West Virginia office, and I always figured I was the token hillbilly, and I'm okay with that. You know, 
you know, I, they, they might have me. They might have me as listen for some nooners. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got the background investigation unit. <laughs> That's funny. So anyway, I because I got married, you know, I was transferred to Miami uh, in um, 1985. I got there uh, April fifteenth, nineteen eighty five. You know, so wow. So that that's almost one year to the date about what yeah. we're going to talk about. So let, let's talk about this. So, were you was that your choice to be on the bank robbery squad, or is that where you were assigned? Well, actually, uh, since since I had worked bank robberies, but let, let me rephrase it. Since I had been on a bank robbery squad and had seen. Other agents work bank robberies. There you go. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty interesting case, you know, pretty interesting case. And so I said, you know, it'd be nice to be on a bank robbery squad. So anyway, my, my wife, was, who was in Miami at the time, she worked in a counterintelligence squad. She was pretty well respected in the office. So I, I told her, I said, hey, can you, can you do some lobbying for me? You know, can, can you get me on a decent squad? I don't want to be on a white collar squad or, or, you know, I don't want to work applicants anymore. So she said, yeah, you know, she said, Hey, the bank robbery squad is pretty good. You know, there were bank robberies, fugitives, um, you know, kidnapping as a man, that's, that's a guy's dream right there. You well, know? that's what you let's, signed up for in it. Yeah, well, let's talk about that because Murph, this is what we were talking about with you and some of the, I mean, we're getting into the heyday of cocaine and, and cartel and uh, lots of activity going on in Miami at that time. So when you were going down there, um, you know, at one time it was, I think LA was the bank robbery capital of the world, but there's a lot of stuff going on in Miami. So when you went down there, just what was your initial impression of the type of crime and the type of activity going on? Was it like you could throw a, a rock and hit five bank robbers or 10, you know, kilos of Coke or what was it like for you down there? You know, see, that's, that's where you have to, t that's where you have to step back with me because I had, I had worked a, a year and a half in Miami in undercover, in an undercover capacity between 1982 and 1983 in that time frame, I was in Miami, and man, you know, <laughs> Murph, this is the cocaine cowboy days, man. Up in the eighties, man, yeah, it was probably. like it was uh, rock'em sock'em robots, man. It was just like holy moly. In in when I was down there working, you see, I mean, it was like it was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I packed I packed the forty five uh, nineteen eleven, you know, in an under, uh, undercover capacity, but man, uh, you know. Like I said, I, I went from Washington field office where everybody's wearing, you know, suits and ties and, you know, you know, senator, congressman, agent, you know, that type of stuff, you know, to like, hey, you know, muchacho, que pasa? You know, it's like, hey, <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> so, so um, you read the, you, you listen to the news down there or you read the newspapers <laughs> and you, you, <laughs> you'll, you'll come to a real fast conclusion in the first week that you're not in Kansas anymore because everything, all the news was like, Four people found dead in an apartment. News at six, you know, <laughs> or news at eleven. You know, the newspaper would say seven people found in the trunk of a car at the M M M Miami International Airport. <laughs> More to follow, you know. Or another um, another headline would be, you know, a gunman shoots three people in the in a in a in a uh, drug fair. You know, <laughs> so it was just. I mean, you knew you weren't in Kansas. I mean, everything was like four people shot. You know, four people found. In in an apartment, eight people found dead in a garage, you know, three people found in the trunk of a car. It was like, holy moly. It was, you like, it was almost every day. I got there in 87 and it, and it was a true awakening. I mean, I came really down. Was. I mean, it was like shocking awakening. You know, and, and the news on TV was like, oh yeah, no. Hey, you know what? If they had a murder, just a single homicide, eh, you know, make it's not news. Yeah. Hey, so how much of the bank robberies, when you started working them, now we're leading into this, you know, you get down there, how many of the bank robberies were drug related? You know, at the time, it did not seem, it did not appear that they were drug related. Okay, when I went down in the nineties, when I went back down to Miami, and then everything was drug related. I mean, the burglaries, home invasions, you know, the the carjackings, everything seemed to be drug related. But back in the eighties, it was just like like the two the two uh, the two characters that I got involved in. They they, they were not they were very health conscious. Okay, they were not into drugs. They barely drank. They didn't do any any drugs at all. You know, so most of those bank robbers was just greed. Well, they, they the criminals back then knew to stay in their lane. If you're going to be a bank robber, be a bank robber. If you're going to be a drug dealer, go be a drug dealer. Ex exactly. I, th I think that's a good way to describe it. You know, because at, at the time, you know, back in the eighties, mid eighties, I, I didn't get the sense that the people were robbing uh, banks to to buy drugs. So tell us. 
tell us about the average day for a special agent Eddie Morales. You know, um, what what does an average day for you during that time look like in terms of like how many active cases did you have at a time? You know, what kind of what was what was the pace of bank robbery and cases like for you? Okay, well, let, first let me answer a question that you posed uh, a couple of minutes ago: the bank robbery capital of the world. Okay, Los Angeles subsequently became the bank robbery capital of the world in the late 80s and early 90s because, I mean, the, the, the Los Angeles was, was, if I remember correctly, they, they were having like anywhere from five to ten bank robberies a day in Los Angeles, okay? And then, and that, I, I, there was something happened. Someone told me that you started having all these drive through banks, and I'm thinking, what the hell do you call a drive through bank? They started establishing banks in like grocery stores, like in Giant or Safeway. You have these little bank, you know, like it looks like a manager's office, but it's a bank. Started having all these banks and, and those types of businesses instead of having a, a bank building with walls and bulletproof glass and, and bulletproof counters and guards and stuff like that. So those are those are harder. Those are hard targets. Okay, you walk into a grocery store and there's a guy sitting behind a desk who's a bank manager. That's a soft target, you know. So, so that it's my understanding that that's why they started having an increase in in, in bank robberies down in in well across the country, really. But Miami at the time, you know, we had a, at least one bank robbery or, or armored truck robbery uh, a day. Now we're competing. Miami's competing with New York and L.A. And, and, and other large cities, you know. So, you know, at the time, it, I don't think Miami could have been, I mean, it could have been up there with, as the bank robbery capital of the world, but we'd have some pretty good pretty good competition between New York and L.A., you know. So, But, but anyway, suffice it to say that we had a, uh, a bank robbery or, 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 or armored truck robbery every day. Now, what did my day consist of? Uh, wake up around 7, have breakfast in bed, Oh, yeah, you know, we can. You can move along a little bit through that Asian Morales. <laughs> <laughs> Read the paper. I don't want to know what happens where you're reading the paper at. Okay. <laughs> Read the paper and then you know have some poached eggs. You know, no, that's not you true. You wish. No, I wish is right. You know, depending on the day. I mean, I usually get up at five in the morning. Sometimes I go off, go out for a run. Sometimes I, I wouldn't. You know, I'd shower. But you know what though? It was it was <laughs> it was great. Life was great, man. I'm telling you, we—I I was working in Florida. I was living on Miami Beach, and I could not wait to get to work. It was so freaking great. I mean, I enjoyed doing what I did, you know. And, and uh, I, you know, I—I I just couldn't wait to get to work, you know. You know, there's a, there's a lesson right there for all our listeners. You find a job you like, you'll never work a day in your life. It's an old saying, but so true. That's that is so true because I I, I was think, I think I've told this to other people before. I said I would have paid you to have me do what I did, okay. And uh, excuse my French. Can I can I use a curse we, word? We are we're explicit here. Far away, bro. Okay. I, I looked forward to fucking up some criminal's day. There you go. Okay. That was that was my mission. If I could fuck up some scumbag's day, a bank robber, a drug dealer, a killer, I I lived for it. Okay, that that was it, you know. And I told people, I said, "Well, you know, why do you, why do you think that way?" I said, "Well, you know, I was, I was young, I was strong, I was well trained, okay, and I had a lot of guns, okay." So I'm thinking to myself, you know, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, who better to do this than me? I mean, uh, if not I, me, then who? Exactly, right? you know. I mean, that's a biblical saying, right? You know, it's like, hey, I, 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 and the Lord said, "Who should I send?" And I said, "Send me." Exactly, exactly. And I'm thinking, who else to, to, to do it, you know? Now, wait I'm a minute. Thinking, I, I want to go back and talk about your violations of bureau policy because you said you carried lots of guns. I have to assume some of these were not exactly approved by the bureau. Oh, no, no, no. See, people, people <laughs> always assume that, you know. I don't know why. Because, I, you know, and I've told people, I say, hey, you know what, though? Back then, you know, things were— A little bit looser? Not looser. Thing, things were pretty—I mean, they were pretty tight, you know. I mean, nobody wants to get fired, you know, uh, you know, I, I could, uh, people say, well, you know, why, why weren't you carrying a 44? Why weren't you carrying a, a 45? So, dude, I was only authorized to carry 38s. 
or 357 Magnums, and I was only authorized to carry a, a Remington 12 gauge shotgun. That's all I had. Now that doesn't say that doesn't mean that I can't carry 238s, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right. Or, or extra speed loaders, you know. So, so you know, but I, I always had the, uh, you know, always had the uh, the shotgun in, in the trunk of the car for for uh, for uh, you know necessity, you know. So, but you know, and it's probably the same thing with DEA. You know, it's like. Uh, well, let me let me take a step back. When I worked undercover, all bets were off. Okay, I carried a forty-five, a, a nineteen eleven forty-five. I carried a Walther PPK thirty-two caliber, and I even had a, a pocket gun. I had a uh, a uh, a Derringer, a Derringer. I forget what caliber. I don't know whether it was forty-five those are usually caliber. Like Twenty-five. like those little Derringers were usually yeah, twenty-five the, 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 or something the, like that. The little Derringer. It's like twenty-two. A 22 Magnum Derringer, you know, it's like a pocket gun, you know. So, so I I did carry in, in my career, you know, uh, exotic weapons, you know, a, a 1911, a Swather PPK, and that type of stuff. But that was strictly in an undercover capacity, and I had every authority and blessing to carry it, you know. So, but when I came off undercover, I had to revert back to uh, to a standard issue, you know. So, but yeah, you know, I carried uh, normal guns, you know. I mean, the, the average law enforcement issue, you know. So. Um, and I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd get to work early in the morning, um, probably by 7, 6, 45, 7, and I'd start going through all my incoming mail, see if I had any, had any immediate uh, requests, um, process that, and then, okay, what did I have left over from yesterday, or, or what what dog cases do I have to, to paper, you know, that type of stuff, you know, cause there were some cases you knew, you know, that were, they were dogs, you know, that's like, Hey, you had, uh, we had some nationwide bulletins, you know, say, you know, this, um, this possible gang of, uh, bank robbers might be might be anywhere in kansas or or miami or la you know, so it's like, okay, be on the lookout, you know, so that type of stuff. And then, uh, th- then you'd paper the, um, the, the um, Fugitive cases were, were slow, okay? They were more methodical cases. If you were sitting in the office and you got a call saying, hey, there's a, there's a bank robbery going on right now at, at the uh, at the First National Bank of Miami, of course, you drop everything and you have to run out run out to, 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 to the bank. You know, that happened more, more often than that, you know? So uh, in that respect, we were kind of like firemen. So, you know, you get the call, you rush out, you know, it, that, that would take anywhere from half a day. You know, I mean, just responding to that, you know, just getting there, sorting things out, interviewing the witnesses, you know, helping with the crime scene, do the follow up investigation and then go back to the office and, and do do your paperwork. You know, so that that could burn up half a day or a whole day, you know, so on average, how many uh, out of, you know, every 10 bank robberies, how many did you clear by arrest? How many were you able to solve? Mm, gosh. <laughs> I would say maybe one a week, one every two weeks. But but see, let, 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 me, let me give you some background on that. If you arrested one bank robber, he might have done five or six. He might have done five or ten. Okay, so you know, if you got one guy, you you probably cleared ten ten robberies. Okay, and depending on on the and uh, we had some gangs down there that were good for for 10, 15 robberies. Okay. So, uh, eventually when you ended up getting them, you know, you, you cleared a whole bunch of cases, you know, so. And what were some of the ways that cases got cleared? In other words, how much of it relied on like you working undercover, which means you, you've been used confidential informants before you use sources. Um, you've got other leads or tips from the public or just good old, just good old fashioned, you know, FBI legwork. So kind of, you know, as you were closing cases, how did you normally, uh, able to find the suspect? Well, it varied. You know, sometimes you know we, we'd get lucky. Somebody would get a partial tag. Okay, that that, that was <laughs> that and that's was pure legwork. After that, you yeah, just got to run yeah. it. Yeah, that, that was death on the on, on the tag. You know, what I mean, and unfortunately, or sometimes, uh, fortunately, the 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 the, the uh, partial tag would be dead. It would be a stolen tag, you know, or a stolen car. Okay, which is what happened in uh, with uh, Platmatics, you know, in, in the the uh, shootout guys. So other times, you know, you would say, hey, you got a good description, uh, and you start matching uh, uh, bank robbery shots. You know, hey, this guy hit in Homestead. This guy hit in, in West Palm or Palm Beach, uh, and this guy hit in Orlando. And, you know, you start linking linking uh, 
cases together and say, hey, we, we got a partial print on, of this case, we, we, or we got to have a shell casing on this case. And so-and-so uh, called and said, hey, I saw the photograph on the news, or I was looking at, at in the bank, you know, had a bulletin board of possible bank robbery suspects. Hey, I, I looked on the, on the bulletin board, and this looks like one of my employees. You know, <laughs> those it, it's it, <laughs> Weird stuff like that happens, you know? Hey, I was going to ask you, too. I, I know that the FBI was always good about collecting information from, like, each robbery, because you would collect things like their tradecraft, how they entered, what they did. What was that called? Bursra or something? Bank robbery, statistical reporting, something? God, I forget what it was called now. You would ask me a technical question and like now, that. Just the reason I'm saying is years later, it factored into some information sharing stuff. But I was always amazed. You guys did a really good job of cataloging and capturing how they it's not just the fact hey what happened it was like what kind of shoes did they wear how did they enter you know what kind of weapon did they use right-handed left-handed you really got a lot of detail i just i just was going through some boxes of mine and i found one of those reports okay and it it is a one page report and it it's in small print and it has little ch boxes you know and it says type of weapon rifle shotgun you know Short, you know, it's so just on it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it asks something like a hundred different questions, different criteria, and, and you know, you know what the the one thing the, the one thing that I really admired about the bureau is that um, every office had what we called a bank robbery coordinator. Okay, it was his job to fill out those forms. Okay. And it was his job to you know for every robbery. Okay, it's like hey, okay, was it one male or one subject, two subjects? You know, obviously, it'd be nice to know whether they were black, white, or Hispanic. You know, obviously, and sometimes we didn't know. Sometimes it was black males. Sometimes it was white males. Other times, unknown. So he would go through the whole checklist, and then he would take that checklist with the name of the bank, and he would circulate that across. Like say in Miami, he would circulate that in the in the southeastern part of the United States. Okay, anywhere from. Alabama, Georgia, uh, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, in that region, he would circulate it, you know, in case anybody else had similar types of robbery. So, yeah, you know what, though, it, it was a good system. And, and it helped, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you had these guys uh, who always walked in with a, you know, a, a, a sawed off shotgun or, you know, what, whatever the case is, you know, because, you know, if you arrested somebody with a sawed off shotgun in Georgia, okay, and you had multiples, uh, robberies in South Florida with sawed off shotguns, you know, maybe there's a connection there. Okay. And then that's when you would start digging deeper in there, you know? So, um, yep. So no, I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, a lot of times, you know, I mean, sometimes we'd get lucky. I mean, sometimes, you know, we had some crazy ass citizens that would, uh, follow, they would see a robbery that see a, a guy or a, a couple of guys jump into a car and speed away. They would follow these people. <laughs> they would freaking follow. I actually talked to a couple, uh, I mean, not, not directly, but I mean, I saw reports where uh, witnesses came up and said, hey, yeah, you know, I followed this guy uh, to, the, to, to the Burger King two blocks away, and I saw him switch cars. It's like, what? So we'd go back and we'd find the, the bank robbery car there, you know, I mean, the, the stolen car. So that would also help, you know, fingerprints. Sometimes people get lax, you know, they, they you know, they think, hey, they're good, you know, and, and they take their gloves off or whatever, and, and they leave their fingerprints inside the stolen car, you know, thinking, hey, I'll come back and get the car later, <clears throat> you know, and, you know, that's how we catch them. You know, just sometimes it's luck. Sometimes it's good witnesses. Well, let's start. And, uh, you know, we've given enough airtime, so we're going to just call them piece of shit one and piece of shit two because we don't want to give them any more airtime. So we know how the FBI loves their acronyms. Unsub, you know, we used to call them Fanu Lanu, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about because at some point in time and the other thing, too, I'm telling you, I pulled up out of the FBI vault. I've got the original reports, the 302s that were written on this case. And um, and it's because let, let's start talking about tracking POS one and two down, because now these guys start coming to your attention. Um, how do you first become aware of what you're ultimately going to be involved with, you know, on April 11th, 1986? When's the first time you became aware of this? Well, you know, that's a that's a good question, you know, because let me set the stage. I, I arrived in April of uh, 85, okay, and I, I was acclimated into the bank robbery squad pretty quickly. And it became 
you know, it became obvious, you know, April, May, June, and July, the summer, that we had uh, two active bank robbery gangs going in Miami. Very simply called, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, <clears throat> very simply, we, you know, because they were all Fanula news <laughs> or unsubs. Uh, we we call them the 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 uh, Hispanic gang or the Cuban gang and the Black gang. That that's all we had. I mean, it was all they were ghosts, you know. So, so we were working those types of uh, those those two gangs, and then of course you had, you always had your your you know lone wolf robber. You know, somebody walk in, you know, with a a gun or or a note. Hey, I've got a gun. Give me all your money, that type of stuff. So, so that that happened, okay. But we had two active gangs: the Cubans and and the and the black gang. And then all of a sudden, <coughs> on uh, here, let me uh, on October nine. Uh, <laughs> I remember this to this day. I was in the office at lunchtime. And we get a call on the uh, on the intercom saying, "Hey, uh, uh, attention, all units! We have a live 91. That's what we called a, a 91. Is a, a bank robbery. Uh, we have a live 91 at the, at the Steak and Ale, you know. And they gave the address. And, you know, there was myself, Jerry Dove, and Albert Ortiz were in the office. We, we, you know, there was only three of us left, and we only had one car, so we jumped in one car and sped down uh, to South Miami." And we got there probably 30 minutes after the robbery. And I say 30 minutes, you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. Getting from the field office to South Miami, it's like 30 miles. Okay. I mean, it's a big city. You know? where, was so, your, where was your field office located back then? It was uh, 36 and, uh, 36, 36th Street and Biscayne Boulevard, right next to the uh, Biscayne uh, Bay. Yeah, beautiful, right beautiful area, area yeah. you know, so. But uh, we, even even with red light and siren, you know, uh, or blue light and siren, you know, we, we'd be, you know, we'd be going down there a hundred miles an hour. You know, uh, it still took us about twenty minutes to get down there. The first thing that stuck struck us was like, what the hell is going on? There was the um, an attempted armored truck robbery, okay, and the um, we got a real quick story: two bad guys. They fired at the armored truck with a rifle, and then they jumped in a car and escaped. <laughs> and the kicker was when they when they're escaping, they're driving out of the parking lot. They they, they <laughs> you know, I have to I still laugh. <laughs> you know the old military saying they they popped smoke. You know pop smoke pop smoke. You know these two guys threw threw out two smoke grenades. Out of the out of the side of their car, when they're leaving the parking lot, you know, to cover their quote unquote cover their escape, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you Who know, what? That? <laughs> even by Miami standards, that's pretty weird, you know. So <laughs> I'm, that's the one and only bank robbery I've ever been to where people pop smoke, you know. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's not like the, not like somebody was chasing them right out of the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Hey, we'll we'll use the smoke to get away. I don't know why the hell they popped smoke because as soon as they dropped the grenades, they were already like half a block down the road. Yeah, it didn't know? serve the purpose. You drop the smoke, you're driving. You drive right past your camouflage. You know <laughs> exactly. You know so, but that right that right away caught. Uh, I mean, um, myself, Jerry, and, and Al's ears like, what the hell are they doing popping smoke for? So anyway, we. You know, we were there. We were, we were three young agents. You know, uh, you know, we were like journeyman agents. You know, the senior agents. Everybody was at lunch. You know, so we started the interviews and so on and so forth. We had uh, two two uh, guards and then uh, some some witnesses in the parking lot. You know, so. But <coughs> the interesting part, I interviewed the. Uh, <laughs> I, I laugh. I'm sorry. I'm an evil man. I interviewed the victim guard. You know, the, they had the driver and the courier. The courier gets out of the um, gets out of the armored truck, goes into the steak and ale restaurant, goes in with a bag, and then comes out with a small bag. You know, the you know checks and and money orders and cash. So he's walking back to his truck, and then he's attacked from behind. Uh, somebody was waiting in, waiting in laying in wait in the shrubs in front of the the entrance. And somebody hit him in the back of the head, knocked him down, and uh, reached down, took his sidearm. And um, then um, 
picked him up and stuck a gun in his face and said, you know, get up, get up, you know, or, you know, the, you know, the usual words of encouragement, you know, get up, get up or I'll kill you, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's a good way to put that, it, that's words always, of encouragement. Yeah, that's always encouraging, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll motivate you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? So they literally stuck a gun in, in, in the back of his uh, his right ear, I mean, just l- under that soft spot, you know, where the jaw and the and the skull meet, and they walked. They had a one of them had a, his arm around his throat and the gun in his in his in the back of his ear. And they walked him over to the driver's side of the truck, and they tell him, "Tell your partner to open the truck, open the back, okay." And <clears throat> what are you going to do? You know, you got a gun in your ear, you know, and and you got an arm around your neck. You know, I say, okay, hey, Billy, open the door. You know? Please. <laughs> Please open the door. But you know what, though? And I didn't know this. I mean, I, I, I think if you logic it out, you know, I didn't really know this was policy. But the policy for these armored trucks is you never open the door. Okay. So, you know, here's this guy with a gun in his ear and, and his partner's in the driver's seat. <laughs> what does he do? He puts the car in drive and he the truck drives away. <laughs> He left his partner there. <laughs> left his partner that sitting. That is cold blooded. <laughs> he left his partner there with a, somebody with an arm around his throat and a gun in his ear. And the teller saying, Oh my God, no, he's stupid. He's stupid. He should have opened the door. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. You know, <laughs> I would have been saying the same thing. You know, it's like I'd, I'd have been calling my partner names, you know. <laughs> so uh, the guy. The guy that had him around the neck pulls back and just whacks him on the head, knocks him, stuns him. Doesn't knock him out completely, but stuns him pretty good. He falls down to the ground. The other guy with the assault rifle opens up on the back of the uh, armored truck with a, an assault rifle. And we, we later we got the casings. You know, we got the uh, two two three uh, caliber uh, casings and fired about. 14, 15 shots at the back of the truck, you know, and, and, uh, obviously what, why, what happens when you shoot at an armored truck, you know, it's, it's armored. Okay. Nothing happens, you know, so the bullets just hit and bounced off and no, nobody, nobody really knows where the hell they went. They were fragments everywhere, you know, so, so, uh, they knocked the, they knocked the guard down. They ran back to their car, jumped in, speed out of the, uh, out of the parking lot pop the smoke grenades and speed away southbound on um, on 97th street you know so that was the beginning of that robbery and okay we said okay it's not the cubans <laughs> and it's not the black king <laughs> you know so it looks like we got a new player in town you know so that was the beginning of of these two guys uh escapades you know it was like wow i mean welcome to miami you know <laughs> What's that song down there? Welcome to Miami. You know the little sexy song they have that uh, uh, yeah. the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> you know? It's so, a whole different. This is a whole different welcome. It's a whole different. You know, we knew that. You know, it was a whole different t- gang. You know, so um, so you know, obviously, you know, we, we we canvassed the area, canvassed all the witnesses. You know, in the restaurant. You know, coming and going. You know, the employees and so on and so. Forth. We had nothing. You know, the, the poor guard, the poor guard saw nothing. You know, he saw, hey, these guys had, uh, they were wearing camouflage clothing, style clothing, gl- black gloves, uh, black um, uh, ho- ho- hoods, you know. <clears throat> I said, hey, I don't even know whether they were black or white, you know, so they spoke English, you know. But Hey, but the one thing, it. the one thing it does tell you, though, I mean, if they're hiding in the bush, at least they got to know that the armored car comes by steak and ale or something, right, to do a pickup. They just weren't there by chance. <laughs> No, no, no. See, it, that shows a lot of uh, a lot of effort on their part. You know, they they had they had staked out. They had they had surveilled. They staked out steak and ale. There, there's. <laughs> yeah, they really. That's uh, that should be a catchphrase for a little commercial. You know, no, but you know what I'm saying. You know, it's like you know, it didn't happen by random. You know what I mean? So they had done their homework basically. So, so we knew. Hey, you know, these there's a new player in town. You know, so we we said, hey, you know, maybe maybe they won't be too bad. Well. Uh, we were, um, we were, we were wrong because next week, uh, on October 16th, <clears throat> there was a call for an attempted armored truck robbery at, at a Daltz, D-A-L-T, a Daltz restaurant, which was uh, from the steak and ale. It was probably about 
20 blocks west on 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 the main avenue east and west <clears throat> so we respond and I, again it's like you know like a 20 30 minute high speed drive down there and this was interesting because the armored truck couldn't find a parking space or a, even a, even a, a, an open area in front of the restaurant so he couldn't park in front without blocking the traffic you know in, in and around the parking lot so he dropped the uh, courier off in front of the restaurant and told the courier hey I'm going to go down to the end end of the row here in the side alley the side alley road and turn around and come back and I'll wait for you there and the guy goes okay fine so the courier goes into the uh, restaurant, does his business, comes back out, and then he walks towards the direction of where the uh, the driver told him he was going to go. <clears throat> so he gets to the end of the sidewalk, the end of the uh, little path there, and he turns into the alley. And according to the to the um, the courier, he said he saw two men hiding behind a dumpster next to the where the armored truck was parked so he said i saw the men that were dressed in black clothing you know they were wearing hoods and gloves and they were hiding obviously trying to hide from me so he said i knew these guys were bad guys so he said i drew my revolver and i came up and i fired four shots at these <laughs> at these two guys, these two unknown individuals, <laughs> okay? And I'm thinking, hey, no, that I like that policy. <clears throat> Who is this armored truck company? And I said, this is preemptive hits. You know, they're making preemptive strikes on, on subjects, you know. That might be funny, but here's the rest of the story, okay? When we, when we got down there, they said, what the hell's going on? You know, it's like, well, no money, no money was taken. Nobody saw anything except the guard. Okay, his partner was was parked in. The, you know, he was he was in the in the driver's seat of the of the armored truck. He said he didn't even see anything. He said he saw his partner come around and starts walking towards the truck. Then he pulls his gun out and he starts firing at the dumpster. Even he didn't see anything. So we talked to the guard and we said, "Hey, man, there were two guys hiding behind the dumpster. They were hooded up." wearing camo gloves and so on and so forth. So I said, hey, I knew they were going to rob me. So I, I just drew my, my, my uh, 38 <clears throat> and I fired four shots in their direction. He said, I don't even know if I hit him. Well, here's the, here's the rest of the story. Do you know who that guard was? He was the guard from the steak and ale who had the gun pushed up in his ear. <laughs> oh, and he was not oh going to go through that again. He was not going to go through that again is correct. you know. So oh. he said, hey, man, I saw these two yahoos over there. He said, screw them. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> <laughs> My turn for payback, man. Wow. So, and I think was if I was him, I'd find a new job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the opinion then of uh, like the local prosecutor or the AUSA? Would they did they consider that a uh, justified preemptive uh, use of force or uh, what was the nothing? No, nothing ever happened. No, I mean, it's like you know, hey, you know, okay, you, you saw somebody, you know, lurking around ambush in, a, in an ambush position, and based on your background from last week, just seven days ago, yeah, yeah. okay, <laughs> okay, we'll we'll give you this one, you know. So, um, no, I mean, nobody, I mean, you know, because he was in an alley. He fired at the, I don't even know if they found, you know, if they found the, the bullet holes in the, in the dumpster itself or whether it hit the wall or what, you know, so. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, this guy, after he was just, you know, held hostage, basically, and now he sees two guys, he's yanking that trigger. It's hard to tell where those bullets went. No killing. I mean, <laughs> uh, he could have been, could have been on the roof, you know, so. Oh, yeah. uh, Jeez. But, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's an omen. You need to go find a different career, a different occupation. Yeah. Yeah. You're no kidding. Wow. So uh, the next robbery is uh, the uh, Winn-Dixie, the, the uh, Winn-Dixie uh, grocery store, which I, I think they still have Winn-Dixie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I we don't have them up here where I live, you know, so, um, um, so uh, this was also an interesting you know, fiasco. High noon 
in front of a of the uh, of the grocery store. Now, let me check. Uh, you know these these bank robbers too. They've been successful these two times. They might be thinking about a career change. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I, I I forget. It wasn't the same. Um, it wasn't the same armored truck company because they had. There were so many attempted robberies of armored truck companies that one of the armored truck companies, I think it might have been the Wells Fargo group, started. They added a, an additional guard in before because before you had the driver and the courier. I think Wells Fargo added a third guy. You know, you know, not, not to coin a phrase or anything, but they added a shotgun. You know, they added a shotgun to the truck. Okay, so whenever the courier came out of the back of the truck, the shotgun, and he literally had a shotgun. Okay. He would walk out and, um, the, um, he would take the shotgun out and he would walk out and look around the area and then signal to the courier to step out. Okay. So, um, uh, then he would walk ahead of the courier and, uh, go to the entrance and kind of like stand by at a port arms until the courier went in and then he came out. <clears throat> so, um, but I think, I think in this particular instance, you know, I don't think he was carrying a shotgun. He was just like an extra gu- guard there. But, um, so the, the truck pulls up to the, to the, uh, the wind Dixie, the two guards step out, one goes in, one is standing outside watching the courier on the inside comes out, and then they start walking. Both of the guards start walking back towards the truck, which is parked in front of the Win Dixie. Okay, so um, halfway between the entrance to the Win Dixie and the truck, the witnesses said the guard said somebody yelled "freeze." Okay, it's like okay, what the hell's going on? And as soon as that word "freeze" came up, <clears throat> there was a gunshot. And uh, what ended up happening was the courier with the money bag is shot in the in the legs with a 12 gauge shotgun. Okay, so they basically fired at his legs. And you know, if you know anything about ballistics, you know when the when that the, the blast of the pellets hits your your legs, it's going to sweep your legs out from under you. Okay, so he was shot in the legs and he went down face first. And at that time. All hell breaks loose. Okay, so the accompanying guard pulls his uh, revolver and he starts firing in the direction, uh, you know, of where he thought the shot came from. And then some, somebody in the parking lot starts shooting at at him and his partner on the ground. Okay, so what happens? Like in this course of ten seconds, there is this massive shootout in front of the Win Dixie. Wherein there were approximately eighteen, there were approximately thirty shots fired in in about ten seconds. Okay, the each each of the three guards, the driver included, fired empty emptied their revolvers. So that's three times th- three six shots. That's eighteen rounds, and then we speculate that the bad the bad guys fired twelve rounds. Okay, so a, t- a total of about thirty rounds, thirty plus rounds. You know. In the span of ten seconds, and the only person that was shot and hit was the guard initially with the, with the shotgun. You know, it's like holy shit. I mean, you had women coming and you know, not not just women, but customers coming and going. You know, inside of the store, people with you know kids and people looking for parking spaces. It was high noon. Okay, so I mean, the the parking lot was packed, and it was absolutely amazing that nobody else was wounded. You know, so um, thank God for the gang that couldn't shoot straight, including the guards. I mean, with that many people around there, you're wondering you didn't have five or six people, you know, get hit with the collateral fire. Exactly. You know, and that's what I say, too. You know, I said, thank God those those Wells Fargo guards were not good shots. <laughs> and thank God they only had six rounds. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but now this is the third time these robbers have been unsuccessful. Yep. Yep. And um, but see, here's the kicker. OK, when I went down there. I interviewed like, uh, I don't know, six people down there, you know, and some of them had superficial information. Some of them, some of it was speculation, but at the end of the day, I mean, that, that took all day. I mean, that was, that was, you know, that, that call came in at noon 
by the time we got down there, by the time we finished working down there, and we, by the time we got back to the office, it was already 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, okay? So what we came up with, with everybody was pooling their information. We had <clears throat> anywhere from two to three robbers. Okay, that's it. We had white males. We had black males. We had Hispanic males. Okay. We had a green car. We had a yellow car, a brown car, a beige car. Somebody said it was a station wagon. Somebody else said it was a pickup truck. And then a third uh, explanation was that there was a, a car with a sunroof, you know, one of those sunroofs that the drivers, you know, that you, people have down there, that somebody, a car was driving around the parking lot with a person standing up through the sunroof shooting while the car was moving. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what the hell kind of information is this? You and know, speaking I about mean, eyewitness testimony being so reliable, the oh, only yeah. thing we can determine is they had a car. You know, they had a motor vehicle. <laughs> they had a car and shots were fired. That's about it. You couldn't even de- establish whether they were white, black, or Hispanics. Okay. And it's like, hey, you know, and we, we interviewed like 30 people down there. Okay, and we had this hodgepodge of information, you know, and you go, know, what in the hell? You know, uh, we recovered some shell casings, you know, uh, uh, amazingly, some uh, from, from the opposite side, you know, there was a 45 caliber and two, two, three rounds. Okay, so, uh, and I don't even know whether they picked up a shotgun husk, but, you know, but based on the, on, on the, on the guard's injuries, you know, he had, uh, it wasn't double, I think it was double lot or, or a little bit smaller, it maybe number six bird shot, something like that, you know. But I mean, still enough to to, to pepper you pretty good, you know, from close range, you know. So <clears throat> now, see, the sad part about this, I mean, we're kind of ch- chuckling about it now, but the sad part about this, the security guard um, was in the hospital. He was a uh, an older gentleman, kind of like me, you know. <laughs> no. you know Probably, probably working to supplement his retirement. You know, he he went into the hospital and he was injured and he was suffering. He, you know, and make a long story short, after about a year, he he died from his injuries. And and I don't know whether he died in the hospital or died in a nursing home, but he never recuperated from the injury. You know, in other words, the the injuries um, affected his health to a point where he he just he just. Uh, he died of pneumonia or something from based on the infection or something like that. You know, that's too bad, you know, so, but the guard died eventually, you know, so. So based upon all the information you guys were collecting in your investigations, the, I mean, you start tying these things together. This is the same two guys at a minimum, right? At least, you know, there are two guys pulling these things off. The MO, you know, the, yeah, the, the modus operandi, you know, it ends up being, ends up pretty much, we, we knew that these guys were, were the same, same group, you know, um, the stake in there was two guys. The dolls was two guys, and more than likely, this is two guys. If it was three, well, that's the Wind Dixie could have been the freaking Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, or whatever. Uh, yeah, all we know it, it could have been. I mean, you could have had uh, <laughs> dancing elephants in the parking lot because you know, <laughs> people couldn't tell you, you know. So, but uh, you know, we we knew that, uh, that we had a third gang operating at the time, you know. And you know, what guys, what I'm telling you right now is all, all the. Uh, I'm only I'm only discussing the cases that we can forensically link to, to to the two bad guys. You know, there were other robberies that had the same. There's a lot of similarities in, in other robberies, but we cannot, you know, conclusively link them through forensics. You know, there, there's at least two or three or five other incidents that that have the same same. Uh, Fingerprint, I guess you'd call it, you know, uh, of these these two robbers, you know. But uh, again, there's no forensics on it, you know. So, well, as with most cases, if they're good for two or three or four, they're probably good for another two or three or four. You never get them for every one that they did. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, um, next robbery was uh, on November the eighth. Okay, I I did not respond to, to the first robbery. Um, it was uh, at ten o'clock thereabouts. And it was more like a uh, like a theft, I guess you'd call it, not a robbery. Robbery. There was a teller going from the main building to uh, 
she was a, an island, one of those island drive through tellers, except that instead of being next to next in the next to the bill or in the building it was an ice and it was an island away from the from the uh, from the main office you know so <clears throat> so she had to walk out there i think nowadays you know they they wouldn't do that or if they have tunnels underneath the ground you know so they don't they don't have they're not exposed to the outside so anyway she the teller and the guard were walking from the main building to the island and then somewhere around the island Okay, and, and and it's like you mentioned before, they had to do some homework. You know, this just didn't happen at random. You know, somebody did did some homework as to see, hey, when when does the teller leave the building, and when does the teller uh, island open, and that type of stuff. You know, so so when they get to the island, the the teller has the key to unlock the building. At that point in time, two individuals pop out from behind the the the, the building. One of them had an assault rifle. One of them had a revolver. And they hit the guard on the head, knock him down, take his sidearm, and they accost the, the teller. And, uh, you know, typical words of encouragement. If you scream, bitch, I'll kill you. Open the door. That type of stuff. You know, that, that kind of gets your attention. You know, so so she's the, the, the lady's all, you know, nervous stuff. She's all tense and shaking and crying and stuff. And she's, you know, saying, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. You know, so she takes a key and she sticks it into the, uh, the, the doorknob to, to unlock the, the, the teller island. She was also carrying a teller bag. <clears throat> so when she sticks a key in, into the teller, uh, into the lock, she's so nervous that she breaks the key off inside the lock that's a lot of nerve to break off one of those keys that's not an easy thing to do no it's it's not i mean that you have to admit that took a lot of pressure okay well you know <laughs> at, at, at this point if i was investigating this robberies i'd be looking for somebody named murphy because every time they try a <laughs> robbery murphy's law steps in <laughs> well thank god because if they were actually good at what they were doing uh at least up until this point probably more people might have been killed they might have got more mm -hmm. money which would have emboldened them more but on the other hand they're getting so – they don't seem that they're quite that good at it yet, but as we know with most criminals, right, that's the problem. They they might get desperate. Things are going to get a little bit worse. Yeah. Well, you know what, though? Your comments are spot on because we were thinking the same thing. You know, it, it was not, not quite the gang who couldn't shoot straight because God knows it fired a bunch, you know. But, you know, we, we could tell that they were kind of amateurish at, at bank robbing. Okay, or armored truck robbing, because so far, you know, it was like, wow, what the hell, you know? So <clears throat> anyway, so the, this this teller, this woman, breaks the key off, and, and she's crying. She, don't kill me, don't kill me, you know? So uh, they threaten her a bit, you know, saying, you bitch, you know, blah, 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 you know, that type of stuff. So, you know, they took the guard's uh, gun, and they took the woman's little uh, teller bag. It was one of those little, um, you know, not a huge bag, but it was the size um, of a manila folder, you know, that type of stuff. And they had like $10,000 in cash in the bag, you know, which, um, which they end up taking. Okay, so, you know, a bank robbery call goes out, you know, so the FBI responds to that. Okay, and that was at, um, at the um, uh, Florida National Bank, okay. And about 90 minutes later, at the uh, professional... Uh, let me think, uh, professional savings bank about uh, 10 blocks away, 90 minutes later, <laughs> they walk in, two, two men walk into the professional bank <laughs> at high noon, and there's about 30 customers inside, and they go in like, you know, like the, the the movie Heat, you know, that you walk in with into the lobby, fire around in the air, you know, everybody on the floor, you know, get down, get down, you know. Uh, I guess they had they had slowly learned, you know. So they walked in, they everybody's on the ground, one of them is by the door guarding the the entrance, you know, the parking lot and the lobby. The second one goes around the teller islands and he, he's asking around who's the manager, who's the manager? You know, and then all the uh, all the ladies are scared, they're pointing at one woman, you know, and of course and you're thinking to yourself, damn it, it's a bad day to be the manager, you know. <laughs> he goes over there and he grabs her, he says Open the back, bitch. Open the back. You know, so and she's crying. And you know, she said, oh, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. You know, 
typical, you know, uh, you know, Hollywood stuff, you know, so she takes a key out, you know, she opens it back and what they had seen, we speculate an armored truck delivery had just left the bank, like within the last 10, 15 minutes and they had dropped off two bags. Okay. And again, this surveillance, you know, they, they were watching the bank. They, they probably had an idea on schedules. So the one in the back went to the uh, the back teller area, the little open vault area, uh, and picked up two um, money bags, the, the big heavy ones, you know, like, uh, you know, they, they each weigh, they can weigh up to 50 pounds each, I suppose. But he picked up two of those bags, grabbed them, and then, comes back to the lobby and nods at his partner says ready so they back away and they jump into a car and they speed away so of course that that robbery gets called in says we had we already had some agents you know 10 blocks away so they responded and by the time i got there we had like 30 witnesses inside the lobby and and the tellers and everything else and and um and it it was absolute pandemonium you know i mean um an actual shot inside a bank, you know, I mean, that, that, that gets people's attention, you know, so, but, uh, that bank, uh, it was the professional savings bank. They, um, uh, 57, $54,000 thereabouts, you know, so, uh, b- between the, the, the teller, uh, you know, the, the two, the two, uh, the two bags, so um, it was a good hit. It was it was a good good hit <clears throat> good hit for them. <clears throat> and uh, at, that was the first time that one of the witnesses had actually seen what type of uh, what type of vehicle that they, they were in. You know, and and uh, one of the witnesses said it was a gold colored Monte Carlo. Okay, the guy was a, a gun uh, a car guy, so he was he was pretty sure on the. On, on as we're going to find out, he may have been a car guy, but he sure as hell, he was colorblind, wasn't he? <laughs> really? No, no, no. This is this is the first car. Oh, the okay. first car. Yeah, was the first a Monte car. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I I forgot I forgot to mention, and I, it might be a might be a good spot to to go back and and correct the record. You know, they had been uh, they had been using um, a um, hold on. The first car that they were using was uh, a gold-colored Monte Carlo um, that um, that was stolen on, uh, let me find the date for you. October 4th, 1985? October 4th, 1985, right. From uh, Emilio Briel. Okay, and uh, his uh, his car was the one that was being used uh, for all those robberies. You know how I, I mentioned before that people were saying, "Hey, it was a yellow car, it was a green car, it was a gold car, it was you know, it was a station way." You know, people were pretty close. You know, it, they saw the gold colored Monte Carlo. Okay, and and you know, it must have registered as beige or 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 yellow or something like that. Who knows? You know, so but. This guy actually said, "Hey, it was a gold-colored Monte Carlo." He said, I, "I know my cars, you know." So that's the first time that we had an actual description of a car, and uh, there was nothing else. I mean, there was nothing else that we had to go on, you know. So, <laughs> so um, that was a pretty good that was a pretty good uh, work day for them because they got um, they they got uh, fifty thousand plus dollars, you know, um, for that. Uh, now, were there surveillance cameras in the banks? You know, guys, at at the time, um, the the uh, banks didn't have "quote unquote" surveillance cameras. Okay, they were, um, um, you know, everything runs on budgets. Okay, you know, you didn't actually have cameras and video. And very few banks had video. Okay, what they had was the. Um, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, time delay. 
In other words, the the camera. It, if it was you took, the alarm, took like a, one picture every you know three seconds or something. It wasn't yeah, full exactly. motion video. Yeah. Exactly. You know, when they hit the alarm, the camera would activate and it would take a picture every three seconds. So you'd get a picture and then three seconds later, you'd get another one and then so on and so forth. You know, so so there was no actual video per se. You know, so um, uh, we did have some uh, some photos. But if you've ever seen those cameras, oh, my God, you know. Hey, look, we can, we can send a frickin' Mars rover and get back crystal clear pictures. But to this day, to get a clear picture in a bank robbery, no, yeah. it, it's I, I do not understand how that can happen. You know, I mean, it's like gee whiz. I mean, it's not like it's not it's like you'd have better luck with a Polaroid camera. You know, you go and then the ca- the camera the the photo slides out. You know, you wait a minute and develop develop it. You know, it was that bad. You know. So uh, no, but they, they did have them. But let me tell you a quick sidebar. I went. To, I actually went to a bank robbery in in uh, North Miami, and uh, it had to be before before the shootout. <clears throat> that that bank was robbed three three times in a row, uh, on a Friday, next Friday, and the third Friday. The first time we showed up at the bank, uh, we said, "Okay, where, where's the film?" And they said, well, "We don't have cameras." And we said, "What?" You know, that's a, an FDIC, Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Company, violation. You know that, right? And they go, yeah, we know. Okay, it's on you. So we get a call the next Friday, same bank, robbery again. This time we show up, there's cameras on the wall. We said, okay, you know, we did the thing. You know, I said, okay, can we have the film? The manager goes, there's no film. And we said, what? Yeah, th- those are dummy cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we said, are you people insane? What the? It's another fine. So we get a call on the third, the sort of God, the third Friday, almost. It was like making an appointment. <clears throat> we show up at this robbery, and then they had they had real cameras a- installed at the time, you know, because it's a man. When you get when you get done with the fine, I mean, the cameras would have been so much cheaper. You know, so, um, but anyway, I, I digress, you know, but no, yeah, you know, there, there, there were, there were cameras in the bank, you know, but I don't know how good the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the resolution was horrible. Yeah. Just check my records. You know, they got away with $41,000 on, on that, um, that robbery. So they had a good day. So they're making more than a typical FBI agent is. <laughs> they're making more than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right. So, uh, so we're up to four robberies at this time, right? Yeah. So where do you guys go with, I mean, you obviously, you know, that they're getting, obviously they're honing their craft. They're getting better at this, but what's your guys' response to this? Hey players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out as always on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.